Hey, fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. Today I'm here with Coach Evan. You've seen him before. I've done a few different videos where we discuss different types of patterns of play, different kind of box solutions that is not IKEA related. Uh, it's about his different uh, approaches to tennis, which is not unique, but he has a very unique way of, of telling it. And now he's written a book called The Shell Game, which is available on Amazon. There will be a link in the description if you want to check that out. Uh, so I start, as always, with how are you, Evan? Good. I'm doing good. Other than when you, you get divorced, you have a little bit of t extra time on your hands sometimes if you're the male um, to a certain degree. So with that time, I've just put all the ideas into one book to start and we'll see how that goes. But but yeah, so like, like I said, this version is more of a defensive version. So this is like a return game version. You can use it for, for offense in a way, but I'm like working on another version for that that I want to I'm hoping to add to this one. So the thing I feel bad about is the format kind of stunk. Like I'm trying to get <laughs> I'm trying to get a former student who's a, a tech guy to uh, upload it. But when you upload it, it kept coming in crooked. And I think it still actually comes in crooked if it's on a phone. But if you're on a, a Kindle, it supposedly works better. But I got to get that. <laughs> I got to get that ironed out so that people aren't frustrated. I think there's some software maybe you can do when you like upload the. Um... Because what's different with this book, which I find quite interesting, and it takes some time getting used to, uh, but it's that you have actually handwritten the book in different colors. And I mean, it's almost like a kid's book, which I think I can relate to because I think like a kid sometimes. Um, so how was your process there? Was it more like, you know, I don't, can't be bothered with Microsoft Word or do you feel like you get your thoughts out better this way? Uh, so I'd say my thoughts are always changing. So if you knew, if you were around me, you'd be like, I, I just divert a lot. So for the markers, I don't even know where I picked up the markers, but what happened was I got the markers sitting there and I'm like, I get used to one color and I'm like, all right, I'm going to change a color here. Well, I'm changing my thoughts, so I need to change a color. So uh, I just started experimenting with that. With that, And then one of the one of my buddies was like, he's like, this reads like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I was laughing about it because like you said, it's, it's, it's like kid-like. So, I mean, if you knew me, I'm like, I'm similar. I'm like a big kid. So it, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny to me, to be honest. And then if I do it the right way, I just feel so magoo. I feel so much like you put me in a box and I just can't be like, I can't word dock it and, and get my point across. I draw pictures and be a goofball. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, I was like, I, and also I like you start kind of straight in and get straight into it. And it's a lot about like, there's a lot of very easy takeaways quite quickly, which is the benefit of this whole uh, format. I think is that you can like you circle some things that are very important or underline and you can get quite quickly some interesting ideas to incorporate in your own play. And this is okay. You say it's defensive, but I think some of it relates pretty well to the whole game. I mean, uh, but there's two subtitles on the cover, which is called How to uh, to Hide Intent and How to Think Outside the Box. And there's also Manipulation of Numbers. Can you just explain a bit what that means in this uh, format? So for friends, it's like hiding intent. It's like, so if I'm using a, a box system, like, and I'm cutting the baseline of fours, like we talked about in the past, I'll use a one, two, three, four, or like a one, two, three on one side and a two, three, four on the other side. So when I hide intent, what happens if I hit box two, which is the deuce middle, I can move my attack either way. So if someone's got a weaker backhand, I'll start on two and I'll get right to four and I'll start maneuvering to in those three boxes. If someone is you know, if I want to get to box one, their forehand corner, it's the same thing. If I get box three, you hit box two or box three, you can move your, your attack either way. And like, in a way, it's like, it's like knowing the answers before the test. If I know I'm playing a box game, you have no idea. Cause I mean, how many players do you know that um, even talk about this stuff, right? There's not many. So, so when I go teach this to some of my students and I, and some college players, it, it takes a little time to grasp, but then when they get it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like it just, Stuff we talked about in the past, it eases all the pressure. When I know I'm playing a one, two, three, I don't care about what you're doing. I just know I'm doing a one, two, three. So, I mean, I hope I got enough drills in there to explain like outcomes. Like, so when I go through the the three box system, you want to keep things simple. Like for instance, like in, in there, I wrote that if you want to attack one, two, and three with your forehand, but on your backhand, you're only going to tap box three. So every time it hits my backhand, I'm going to crank box three with different ball flight, whether it's, you know, flat two-hander, heavy two-hander, slice, different forms of slice, just gearing you to just bait. I'm baiting you to go over my forehand side. When you and I bait you, I'm going to crank one. But I can also crank two, 
and I can open up the back end corner. There's just so many different formats you can do with this pattern. It's not like very simple. It's not like winter ball where you're just cranking the corners um, and just kind of tap the middle and then crank the corners. I mean, that's very, it's good, but it's very easy to understand what's going on. When you use a box system, it's very complicated. Like you're, you're messing with the person's head, you know? So if you see like one of the things I put in there was like the difference between tights and mids and stretches, like a lot of good top players like Alcaraz is using mids. Uh, Djokovic obviously uses mids, which is that distance between box one and three or two and four. And then you can even pull people outside the doubles alley. And it, it, when you pull them outside the doubles alley, you're just using the same distance. So if I pull you outside on deuce side and I crank the box two, I'm still using a mid. You know what I mean? So I'm still I'm still using the middle of the court and I can start my attack either way. Um, but yeah, and then in the meantime, I'm hoping to get I'm not making another book. I just want to make an expansion or add to this book probably by the summer, end of the summer. I'll probably put a an open three box system together. Um, I just have to put on, <laughs> I just have to get my markers going. I just bought a new set of markers <laughs> so I can get that going. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, approach to it, definitely. And I think from doing the podcast before, I think a lot of people resonated with the ideas. And it obviously takes some time to actually work these patterns into your own game because i mean it's it's a the box system being you cut the court in uh, in four different boxes let's say i mean you can cut it in more boxes but that's the main foundation and let's say if you're doing a one two three you know you obviously benefit a lot from having that system because it's so much easier to play without thinking as you pointed out but to get to that point where you feel like you're you're in that zone of playing the system. It takes a while, right? It's not like something you, you just go and, and, you know, start doing straight away. No. So that's what I talk about. I think I talked about in the book, but if I didn't, it's, I call it playing outcomes, right? So if I'm playing with you and I, I'm using a one, two, three, and I keep cranking box three with my back. And every time you go to my back end, I start seeing what, you, I mean, you only get so many outcomes you can do. So once I stop thinking and I start just playing, and I go do it to somebody else and do it to somebody else, the outcomes kind of keep showing up, the same outcomes. All of a sudden, once you get that muscle memory, I mean, yes, it does take time. I mean, and then when you get off of it, you have to relearn a little bit. You have to relearn as much. I mean, it's like riding a bike. You, know, you don't have to think about riding a bike. But at first, you're like, okay, what's going on here? But um, but it's, it's not as simple as riding a bike. I'll try to think of another. I mean, the bottom line is once you start playing outcomes, with different players, you're going to start seeing a lot of the same stuff. When you start seeing a lot of the same stuff, it starts kicking into your muscle memory. And now all of a sudden you, you do it without thinking. And then really what I've been like thinking about a lot of, I do it, but I don't know if a lot of people do it. I don't watch the ball. I watch a player. Like the player is what my primary focus on. And I watch your movement while the ball is coming to me and I make decisions. I'm not perfect, but you know, everyone can kind of think what they're going to do, but I kind of manipulate feet. Like that's like a big part of my game is how to manipulate players. So when I talk about manipulation of numbers, I mean, you have to like focus on certain ones. Like I'll put a post on something about like some crazy drills, but once you do them and, and they become part of you, it's, it's, you can do them without thinking, but yes, it does take time. Um, and like friends, and if I had like a, like there's a local guy, he's like a 28 year old futures player. And I'm like, I'm like, buddy, you're too old. It's going to take you about 18 months, you know, to train this into your systems. But if you're 16 years old and you're a top 50 player in the country or in, in the world, like ITF, you can work this in the system. It takes a little time. I mean, you look at Alcaraz. I mean, he's, he's obviously doing pretty well and he's starting to, he's doing some form of a, I call it a power four. Like he's playing an aggressive combo, but he's using the middle of the court to tap out and then to move to ball to either side. Uh, Sinner's doing it too. Um, but out of the top guys, there's only a few that I see, I see doing some form of middle. And um, one of my buddies just alerted me to something that Tommy Paul is doing. He calls it Sydney. Have you heard of this? I haven't heard of it. No, but it, Tommy Paul has made some great strides in the tour. So I mean, I'm not sure. I'm sure he's changed or improved some key aspect of his game because he did make a leap. Although I mean, he's always been talented, but he was stuck for a while, right? Now he seems to be playing much better. Yeah, and my problem with this stuff, like like I said, it's not perfect. The way I wrote it up was just, it wasn't, it doesn't, it looks like I just wrote it up on a weekend, but it took me like three months to put it together. And then I rewrote it a couple of times um, to make it a little cleaner. I know it's not as clean as it probably could be, but um, but I did the best I could. <laughs> but I also wanted to get my ideas out there because I post too much stuff and people get wind of me. Or like I've 
since we've done our podcast, like people reach out to me from like all over, like all over the, the world. And some CEOs and stuff like this say like, you know, I really like that Jokovic podcast, like the stuff you talk about, the training, the box training is very interesting and blah, blah, blah. And so my thing's like, well, if people are starting to find out about it from the podcast, then I, I need to get this out there. So uh, it'd be like, I'm like the father of box training, but, <laughs> but I don't know if there's other people doing it. There's not a new system. The offensive system is very similar, but it, it's, you can use them for serve and return patterns. It really matters who you're playing. And then I, to be honest, I like doing some of those player packages. I know I picked on some people. I pick on Brooksby a lot, but, um, but usually it's like, uh, what's that saying? Like when you're picking on somebody, it means you like watching them. You know what I mean? Like you like play, you like their play. Um, but even Daniel Collins, I threw a piece in there, and someone wrote to me said, "Do not post this on Instagram. You need to you need to put this in the book." So I said, "All right," and I picked on her a little bit. And what, in what way did you pick on her? Like it's, um, what, like, do you see any differences in general of the WTA ATP if you compare them? Like how they play? Like do you see a lot of like? box kind of play in the WTA? No, no, the box, no, I see more winner ball. Um, I see more just set crank, set crank, you know, just like they're just going to pop the corners. Any, you can't hit the same box twice. You hit the same spot twice. They're getting, they're taught to just crank. Um, but for Danielle Collins, yeah, I, I, I basically, I called her a bitch. Um, I said, but I said in a good way, I said you, that bitch got you the top 10 in the world, but you're not going to be, you're not going to win a major until you conquer the bitch. Like you have to like, you know what I mean? Like we all have something we have to conquer. Like we all have something we got from childhood and it gets us to where we're going when we're 20, 25, 30. But at some point you got to kind of not grow up, but you got to kind of like sit there and be like, Hey, you need to conquer this thing. This thing that got you this far, it's, it's limiting you now. So now you got to move on from it, but you still got to keep it in the back. But you got to move on. Like I joke around with Sissy Poss too. Like, <laughs> like I'll say Sissy Poss is close to winning a major, and I say he's got to get a little buddy. He's got to get. He's got to think outside of himself. Like he's got to be stop being so selfish. Like if he cared about something that wasn't himself, he'd probably win a major or two or three or four. You know, like meaning he's so selfish. I've never seen somebody who's more selfish than that guy. <laughs> that's a that's a hard one. Uh, in what what way do you mean? Like I think tennis players in general are some of the most selfish people I've, I've ever uh, seen. Like, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean that also not only, only in a bad way, but I think it's, it's a, a sport where it's not a team, obviously it's an individual sport where you, your whole ego is, is supposed to be around you winning, right? So everybody wants to build your ego up. You have a whole team based on that. If you're the ATP level, then some people, in your team or your parents or your coach can keep you in check. Like, for example, like David Ferrer, he was locked in the cupboard once by his coach when he was 17 and he was acting out. And then he became David Ferrer that we know that is never giving up, always happy, always fighting. You know, it, it taught him something. And some of these players, I would probably maybe Zverev, Sitsipas are good examples. Like, you feel like they have all the potential in many ways, at least a lot of potential, but it's like something... They're they're a little bit childish in a way, right? That that blocks them. So I think the, that's what you meant with with uh, Steph, I guess. Or yeah, like so. He, like I was thinking about the other day, this guy just found somebody in life that he could care about, like you know, other than his father, which I don't know how that relationship is, but I mean, fathers and their sons are interesting anyway, in any level. But um, but I just feel like he's so wrapped up in stuff that's holding him back. That if he can just loosen up, you know, I don't know if it's whatever he's got to do. He's got to find something in his life that's like, for instance, like when I had kids, I say before I had kids, like you said, I'm, I was, I was one of those potential players, super selfish. And I was so concerned with winning. I was so concerned with like my own training and everything. I never let anything get in the way, but the, that was the problem, right? So it only got me so far. But once I had kids, I mean, at that time, at that time I was not playing anymore. So when I had kids, I was like, wow, there's something bigger than me. It's, this is tennis. This tennis thing is not really that big of a deal as much as I thought it was, but it is a big deal. You know what I mean? But if I'd have had that piece, when I was younger. I probably would have opened my game a lot more. Like I was too closed off to, like, I, I talk a lot about connection. I, was, I wasn't connected. I was only connected to myself and that's all I cared about. But if I was connected to a few other people, I probably would have opened myself up a little bit more. And when we more relaxed when I played, like I was a little uptight, you know, I hated to lose. I, I didn't like, 
any of that stuff. I never thought it was a possibility, but it is crazy to think, right? To, to think you could never lose. Um, but once you accept like the battle, once you accept like the connections, like other connections, like people and stuff like that, you, you definitely open another element you can, you can jump into, you know, another level you can go. You think like it, there's, um, cause you see it with some players, like for example, Novak, when he's not caring so much, he doesn't play nearly as well as he do, does when he goes into his warrior mode, right? So he's, he draws from some like um, old Serbian war anthem and, and he's just in the zone, right? Suddenly he just refuses to lose. And in some players, you don't see that quite. They don't have that, like, whether it's a dark or a bright place, it's hard to say. I think it de depends on the player. But they don't, ha they don't have that, like, ultra fighting instinct. Maybe their parents were rich when they grew up and they had a little very soft... Or there's not something maybe that connects them, like you said. Uh, and how can they then get something to connect them? In case of Stefano, we just, I mean, I don't know Stefano's really well, I met him once, but uh, so I don't know what's bothering him really or if anything is bothering him. But uh, if we would play around with that thought, like how can you get something to connect to or care about for more than your tennis results? So for me, for, for I want to talk personally, like in the past, I never talked about anything, right? I didn't want to share anything with anybody. Um, but I'll say, like, even, for instance, like, going through divorce. Like, you go through divorce, you got to make peace with it. You can't make peace with it. Then you're going to be holding yourself back the whole time. So I feel like the same thing for anything. Like, you have to learn. When I say make peace, you can't just sit there and be like, I'm going to make peace. Like, so for me, making peace was making sure my kids are, are you know, cared for. Make sure that I'm not just drifting. You know, when I'm in a position where I'm seeing less of them, when I have to really pay attention to what time I do have. So it's the same thing for the tennis players on tour. It's like the training. I mean, you got to know your body, obviously. Um, but you got to make peace with results. You can't like harp on stuff. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, even in college, if I lost on a Friday or Saturday, my weekend was ruined. If I lost early, I'm like, I'd, I'd hang out with people, but I'd be like a dead, dead weight. I'd be like, I just got to go like figure out what the heck's going on. Um, but now, I mean, I could play a match on Friday, lose, and just be like, all right, I'm going to hang out with some buddies or like going to hang out with this, going to hang out with my kids. I don't really care. It was, I put whatever I had into it and I lost and I can live with it. But in the past, I don't think it's hard to explain, but like making peace with things and understanding, um, like all the writing I've done has like helped a lot for me. And I probably had a lot of, a lot of demons to conquer too, um, it's a cathartic thing to write, I think. And it's the same for me, like whether I write like a, a novel or I'm writing a song or whatever I'm, I'm doing, but it's, it's always putting your um, pen on the paper or, you know, word process or whatever you choose, right? It's, it's quite, it's freeing in a way. I mean, I, I think that's why people or therapists, whatever, recommend like journaling, even I think for players, like to journal to after a match to go and sit down and be like, okay, what happened? Like break it down, like, when why did I not muster up any energy in the third set after going down a break, you know, or something like, for example, like that's to try to break it down, not only with a coach, because I know people who have can afford coaches, they can sit down with the coach and the coach can tell you, you know, I think you did this, but to also do it for yourself without the coach input. So you know what you felt about certain things, you know, that might not come out in that conversation afterwards. Yeah, with with, with the writing, it does help. But you also, you leave yourself exposed to stuff. People can be like, oh, look at this guy. He got divorced. He might be a real winner um, and whatnot. But and then, again, another joke I was making like a couple of weeks ago was about how, I wonder how many, how many marriages COVID killed, you know, like, and killed a lot. But in the end, it, I mean, things happen for a reason. Like you gotta, if you're not connected, you're not connected. I mean, so like in the case of me, it's like, whatever i'll talk about it. i don't really care like i'm pretty like i'm pretty much like an open book but when you're just not seeing eye to eye i mean what are you gonna do stay in the stay in the situation and, and let the kids watch something deteriorate or you're gonna get out of the situation and kind of but it's hard because then you gotta mend you gotta mend the lines you know you, you like friends i got one kid i gotta i gotta really put some work into my other kids it kind of like fluctuates so for me it's it's uh <laughs> it's not easy no it's never is and and you have four kids as well so it's not like a right four yeah four so it's gonna it makes it harder for some and then you gotta 
like I said, almost like I got to keep it in my mind on the forefront. I got to know who's who's getting more attention, who needs the attention, what's going on with this person's life. I got to stay relevant. Um, I got to communicate, sometimes not verbally, sometimes in different ways. But, um, but yeah, it makes it harder. And then, and then to do that and have to work at the same time, yeah, it's not easy. Puzzle in life, right? Because yeah, you also give you give yourself time to to heal a bit or whatever you need to do, and or reboot uh, would maybe be a word. But the kids also need to reboot a bit, and it's it's tougher on the kids generally than adults. So it's like, but everybody, I mean, it's usually fine. But it's 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 a process, right? It will take a while. You write songs? I do, I do, yeah, yeah. It's a hobby thing, but I I do, yeah. I I find that like I mean, I used to write. I'm, I I worked on so many. Like I I published two novels. Um, and I've always been writing like, but uh, now it's, it's more like, I like the shorter formats, then it's a period. Then I might in a month, like the longer format again, but now I prefer, and also guitar playing for me is, is very, um, meditational. So I feel like I, you know, you lose track of time if you're stressed about work or whatever, or, you know, you have to plan something. If you sit down with either a book or guitar or music in general, I think you, it's just time just, whoosh, it's gone kind of. You're in the moment. I I kill it. Like I for my Spotify last year said something like I listened to like ninety percent more than the whole population or whatever. But I listened to like something like fifty thousand hours. How do you manage that? When when do you listen to it? Because I, I can't listen and and work if there's lyrics involved. I can listen to focus music, like this like background stuff, but not like music properly. Yeah, so it, it does distract. Um but like overnight, you know, I'll have it on. If I don't have it on, I'll have the phones on, um, even while I'm sleeping. Um, especially during these times, like these last nine months, I listen to a ton. Um, but like you said, it depends on the music. Uh, if it's old, old music, my brain's already heard it so many times, it just shuts off. But just and then finding music. There's a weird part about it is like just finding music that's relevant to today. You know, it's like that's when songs pop up. I'm like, geez, I'm like, where does this come from? Why am I? Why is this song like? mean anything to me and I, I never heard it before and all of a sudden you just listen to it like you loop it like i'll loop songs while i'm watching tennis and and i'll laugh like the it's like the song was written for me that that's the that's the healing part of songs or or the good part i like especially uh i'm a kind of a lyricist uh, mostly i like i like the interesting part I, I really like to study the lyrics and the structure of the song sometimes uh but what do you listen to you listen to a bit of everything i think no a bit of everything uh i say not as much rap but so for instance like now it's been a few weeks, but at the end of uh, beginning of May, end of April, there was a college team locally that that lost their coaches, so they call me up. You know, I'm like the hitman, come in and finish a season. And some of the girls on the team, there's, a, there's one from Spain, there's another one from LA, but they're Spanish background. So they they start putting songs into the pod or not the pod, um, the playlist, and it's like something like you ever hear this bad bunny or something like that there's like some like spanish rap music and i'm like something like that and i said what the heck is this crap you know i'm like an old 40 year old white guy but um but so i i listened to it and i'm like it's actually not that bad i remember one time i was i was leaving and it popped on on the playlist and i'm listening to it and i didn't even know the whole time i'm listening to this and i'm like laughing at myself I'm like <laughs> i'm like how am i even listening to this stuff it's so crazy but, um it's all in spanish and i'm just like but the beat's good I'm like I don't care as long as the beat's good. Like, but I feel like Spanish music is pretty cool anyway. Yeah, Hispanic music is is um, has a good uh, good vibe to it generally. I think. And yeah. So, friends, like I told you, like I'm hoping. I don't know if it will be too, but next May I'm hoping I can get one trip to to Spain. And if I do, I probably every night I want to go listen to some kind of music, some kind of Spanish music, some kind of something, some local music that uh, because like you said, it's like when you when you read the lyrics or when you listen to the song, you can. I don't know, put yourself there. One, if I don't know, understand Spanish and I, I don't, you can see it. You can see it when they sing, you know, the emotions um, and what they put into it. But um, that would be interesting. We'll see. Hope so. Hoping to. How's your tennis watching going then? Because like if you, um, I know you've been busy with, with stuff, but uh, you've been watching anything. Like now it's been the clay court season. We've seen Madrid. Uh, Alcaraz is is doing really well so far, you would say. But then today he lost to a Hungarian guy who I knew was strong, but not that strong. Uh, Marocan, Marocan, Fabio, Fab, uh, some Marocan, I think. 
I haven't watched as much since Australian. I watch it bits and pieces. I watch a final here, a match here. Like I watched the uh, Alcaraz Striff match. Um, that was a good match. I saw that as well. Striff was playing. Like, what do you think Striff did there to actually be on equal terms with uh, almost? <laughs> he just didn't want to stay on the baseline like Alcaraz because he knew he was going to get crap handed to him. But um, but he's a big dude. He's like six six or something. But he just came in. He just came in often and attacked and. I think I wrote a little piece on it, but it was just basically about like changing time. You know, if you ever play a serve and volley, it's like frustrating. You can't get any timing. So, but if the person stays back and is cranking balls too, that's annoying. If they stay back and they keep the points longer, that's even more annoying. So it's like, I think people are starting to, I think that part of the game will come back for the more talented guys, like the coming to the net, moving forward. Um, because you, you guy like Alcaraz, you're not going to let them just take pots. It's like a, shooting fish in a barrel for him yeah he, he it's a it's a game almost like it, it's he unlocks video game mode and then he just plays uh with without thinking it seems like it's almost so ingrained that he can just he can as well crack the ball anywhere and then or or if it doesn't make a winner he hits a drop shot next shot so there's like no chance for the opponent anyway uh, it's almost like a cheat code you know, yes somehow and then you play with a lot of rackets what is your opinion on this because i I think the Babylon racket is the best drop shot racket on the market. I can hit nasty drop shots. When I hit a drop shot with an arrow, it doesn't go anywhere. It goes over the net and just dies. When I hit with a head racket, it it's more particular. It it moves a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's it's hard to give too much of a of a like a statement of what's the best uh, certain stroke racket. But I know what you mean as well because that stiff s surface and coupled with the pretty large string bed, pretty open creates a response in and the, the bubble rackets at least some of them are, are very um direct in feel right there's not a lot of dampening going on so you know where the ball is going to go right and you can get that nasty spin if you want the nasty spin i i agree with with in terms of drop shots i hit my best with bubble rackets as well i would say like if, if i would have to generalize uh then i i do love like my old prestige and stuff like that but but overall the way you can play with the ball with the bubble this is quite different right you can add a lot of spin both underspin and side spin and uh, top spin right yeah for me i up the new gravity like i think it's the gravity pro maybe february or march maybe it was march but either way i picked that up that thing is like you know we're always looking for a racket that's got a bit of everything and now i can play flight and i can play power and my slice is fine my volleys are fine the server's actually got more pop to it and it says it's 200 on the side but i don't think it is i think the more pop than the prestige it's like the prestige on steroids a little bit. Yeah, I would say that that's exactly what it is. I, I would say I would give it maybe 250 or whatever they want to call it. And they have the CPI scale, which is not like scientific 100%. But with the prestige, you have a 98 square inch head size. Then the rest is pretty much the same. You have a little bit less static weight on the Gravity Pro, which I'm assuming you mean. But then that extra 100 square inch head size, which is also kind of wide, right? So it's a different shape gives you more on the ball and also gives you better stability. So even the off-center shots, you have a little bit more leeway there. Uh, on the prestige, you get punished immediately. If you hit anywhere off-center, it's it's a, it's a punishing racket, right? Yeah, the weird thing is, like, with the prestige, I, I like the, uh, what was it, the Lynx Touch, the new, that newer one that came out. I put it in the gravity. Indoors was all right. When I went outdoors with the grittiness of the outdoors and the sand on the courts, it, it's good for about a day or two, and then all of a sudden it just loses its pocket a little bit. So I'm having issues with that. But that's where, like, a head hawk touch has a little more playability out in the outdoor courts for some reason. I don't know why that is, but I don't get too scientific into it. I just, I just play by feel. But I just know the head hawk touch works a little bit better for me outside on the, you know, because we got the pollen, we get the sand a little bit. I got to blow the courts all the time. Um, but when I don't blow the courts, it's picking up that grit. It just doesn't stick to the head hawk touch like it does the, the Lynx Touch. Yeah, I actually did experiment to uh, on my Prestige to add Lynx Touch in the mains, and then I had Head Hawk in the crosses, and that was probably the best uh, setup I found that worked with Lynx Touch as a softer string, but then you add like a slightly stiffer string. You can add in the mains or the crosses, that's a little bit up to you, but I did that, and that, that actually really worked well, right? So, that's a good pocketing in that string. Yeah, and for me, I'm old school. Like, I, I still have one-piece my, my rackets. I one piece because it gives me gives the pocket a little more playability in the long run. 
after you start, the more you hit with it, the more release it gives. When I do a two piece, it's a tighter pocket and it doesn't give as much, at least I feel like, I don't know what the, the word is on it, but it just doesn't give as much as like the one piece does for me. Do you, you string yourself or still? Kind of. I still got my old stringer. I paid 500 bucks for it. Like a, it's a big one. It's a, it's a old school Ectalon. Uh, do you remember those ones? Is it an electronic or? No, no. Free electronic. This is like, I think I bought this in like 93. And it's still going strong. Yeah, it's still going. The tension's always good. I always, but I, I take care of my stuff. Like when I, I release the tension all the time. I mean, I do what you're supposed to do. Well, well then, I, I mean, that's important because, I mean, you, you this stuff would stay for longer and, and work better, right? Yeah, and that coil won't like get squished. I mean, anything, you know, our generation, we had stuff, you, you know how to take care of it. The new generation, I, I question. <laughs> they never had to like work for anything as much as we did. <laughs> no, I think they are uh, kind of living off the spoils of the previous generation. So it's a little bit like uh, they're a bit more complacent when it comes to actually, like, I mean, when you, once you got like a computer when you were younger, it was so expensive by that time. So it was like, you know, you had to cherish it, right? It was like, wow, this is a magical piece of equipment. Now it's like, oh, I broke my iPhone. So mom, can you buy me a new iPhone? <laughs> it's like a 1500 euro, 1500 buck phone, right? It's insane. Like what the parents give the kids. And I, I, I understand, like I'm, I'm the same with, with uh, my kids. So it's like, uh, a, you know, you spoil and then you're like, what the F am I doing? As your bank account gets depleted. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting time because they are, they request more. And as a collective, it's also, you don't want your kid to be completely left, you know, without, hang, you know, keeping up with the rest of the, the craziness. Right. So you gotta be like, okay. Yeah. You, you can't fight it because, uh, it's, it's uphill battles. So it's not even uphill battle. It's like a mountain, but, um, but friends and when I'm coaching now, it's like the kids these days are what they call work is like what I would call warm up. Um, you know, they don't, they don't allow their body. It was, it, it's not so much their fault too. I don't want to blame the parents, but it's, it's just society in general. You have to allow kids to suffer. If you don't allow kids to suffer, then they're, they're never going to learn about themselves and whatnot. So like, I feel like a lot of parents are stepping in way too early. They're not allowing because they don't want to sit there. They don't want to see their kids suffer. Well, my parents were never around. So like they, they never, and when they were, it was like, you're getting yelled at for something. So you're always, you learn to grow fast, but you learn about yourself, right? But these, the today, it's like the, the parenting is a lot different. And I'm guilty of it too. I'm not perfect, but but at the same time, I do sit back. I do, I'm able to pull myself away from it and be like, hey, this is your shit. Deal with it, you know, learn. Because you're gonna, at one point, you're going to be on your own and you, you better deal with it now or forget about it or you're never going to get anywhere. And I don't want no 30-year-old living with me. No, no, I, I would think that's that actually you, you have to have. I subscribe similarly. I mean, like it, it's you can't be too lenient with everything, right? You have to have keep some of that old school mentality. But then, like you know, our generation of parents, they were they were a little bit more like you know, yeah, you go out, I you know, we'll see you later, I guess, right? They had no idea who you were, <laughs> where you were, who you were. They they knew maybe depending on how many kids they had. But it's like they, they, yeah, you know, things will be fine. You know, hopefully nobody, no rapists or murderers will <laughs> find my kid. You know, it's pretty re relaxed. I think every town had a white van. Like just, hey, you see a white van, just run. <laughs> just yeah. Yeah, no, no, but that that's used to be the thing. Like I think in other countries as well. And, uh, and you know, like the dirty men or stuff like your parents would warn you for like, you know, if you see someone try to give you candy, you know, you, you better bolt, right? It's not... That was about that, you know. Today it's a lot of helicoptering where they're like, "Okay, I have your iPhone location, I have your your eye tags and whatnot," you know. So it's like this constant. You have more of a constant connection all the time. Like it's it's, uh, you know, I used to always text with my kid all the time. Like, "Oh, you're where are you? Like, what are you doing?" This is, and then I'm like, well, "That is not the way maybe to do it." But it's like you would be texting just to check. Like, are you? It's okay. All good. Yeah, in my town there was this one guy, huge beard. He had like military stuff on. Like he's, he's just, we knew him as the bum who lived under the bridge. But whether he lived there or not, who knows? But um, <laughs> like it always like it was probably a Vietnam vet, right? So they they go from the war and they come back. But when you're a kid, you don't know any better. You just see like, oh, look at that guy. He looks like a crazy person. Um, but one of the jobs I worked when I was in Connecticut, my first like full time gig, there was one of those guys too who used to walk around the downtown area in Mystic, Connecticut, which is like, it's like a seaport in a way. 
And so one time, me and a couple of guys I worked with, when we knew the bum guy was on the other side of town, we knew it would probably take him about like a good hour to get to where his, we always see him going to the woods and we're like wondering what the heck's up in those woods. And so we, we knew he's not an hour away from a walk. So we, we pulled over and we took a, took a jog into the woods and we found his little house. It was like literally plywood sheets of sheets of plywood. And it's like this little house. He had books. I'm not lying. There's probably about 30 cats living there. Like there was cat food opener, like there's food open. It was crazy. We walked in there, but we're sitting there like, crap are we gonna get booby trapped is there gonna be like a bouncing betty is there gonna be like a like a bear trap like who's gonna get we're laughing about it while we're walking through we're like who's gonna fall into the booby trap and then uh, nothing ended up happening so it was pretty funny um but it, it, i don't know <laughs> coming back on that on that white van theme it's kind of sad in a way but it's also like maybe i mean these days you sometimes see people who just want to get away from modern society no matter what like doesn't matter if they have an addiction or uh, they lost their family money, whatever, you know, it, it's like they just don't want to be in in regular society, you know, with social media and uh, digital stuff and whatever, right? I mean, it's hard, but I mean, you get days, like, I don't know if you, you write a lot. So I think from a writer's perspective, it's like some days I just want to like hop in a car and get the hell out of here and just take like a week off or two days off, whatever it's going to take me to clear myself out. But, um, but you can't do that. You know, you got to sit there and, and just keep grinding, which is fine too, I guess. But um, but too many people live on that social media. They put their life out there. I'll write some stuff. I don't care. But um, but they put all their their life into telling everybody what's going on. It's like, hey, you save some of this for somebody who maybe means more to you. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 a weird situation where everybody has their own reality show in their phone, right? So it's like uh, before it used to be okay. They pay Kardashians a lot of money to sell their life. I mean, it's obviously a manicured life uh, with uh, with a script or or kind of a storyline, but still, it's like a you know part of their life. And today, everybody's doing it for free, right? <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's it's uh, it's all about chasing chasing those uh, likes. It's uh, very very strange, uh, and, and obviously, like it's a game. So, like when you have a YouTube channel, which I I do obviously, and then it's you 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 look at the stats, uh, things are going down. I need to create more videos, and then you have to create so much content that you're um partly you're working all the time but it's also like it's a st extra stress just to have that number you know if you didn't have the numbers you'd be like okay i'm gonna do three a week and then that's about it you know yeah, and even with those posts when you're going for the likes and the, like the, the whatever's um it's funny on instagram the biggest post i made was a, was like one of the dumbest posts ever i just post a joke on, like a one-page post on pickleball like all my training my hundred million burpees my thousands of push-ups my this my that and, and i don't know why it hit like uh, for me a lot is like 15k it hit like 15k looks and i was like that was like the dumbest thing ever like what how'd that get that many hits when when i post some stuff on like some of the drills you kids should be doing and that gets like maybe 300 hits or 500 hits i'm just like eh. but but you know it comes back to like i don't know what you look at but like for instance on tiktok i'll go on tiktok now and there's this one I can't stop looking at. It's kind of funny where this guy owns a convenience store, but he sits back in a cooler and he's like shooting people in the face while they're going to get their Gatorades and their, their beer and stuff. And I'm just cracking up laughing. And even my little one, my eight-year-old, she's like, hey, can you send that to my, my iPad <laughs> so I can watch it? I find TikTok to be like, a, I mean, you know, a horrible. I mean, now I have a TikTok, TikTok account. So trying to upload videos there is not easy to get any traction because you need to make it very bad. Like, otherwise, it's not going to... If, if you try to give away, like, valuable information in any way, and I'm not saying my information is valuable, but um, if you're trying to do something with some quality, it's not going to work. Like, you need to go for the lowest common denominator. Like, you need to be like, this is a retard with a filter. This is what... You, ha you have to get there, you know? And it's... it's I, I am really... I get really sad when I scroll on TikTok. Luckily, I don't use it very often for my own use, but... But it's like, I'm like, oh no, what is the humanity? Because it all goes down to like the low. I think it's a little bit the same with music sometimes. It's like, um, there's obviously all kinds of music and, and, you know, you should look outside the mainstream. But it, what's mainstream is always this so easily digestible, right? It's, it's like they, they have removed all the essence of everything and made it like one thing. So it's always the same chords or the same beat or the same this that it's in at the moment. And I feel like it's the same with TikTok. Like, okay, this filter is very popular. So now everybody's using this filter or this sound is popular. So now we should all use this. And then you have 60 million views on one video. 
And, and it, the virality is amazing. So if you strike gold, you strike gold. Like you won't do that with Instagram maybe or, or with YouTube, but it, it's also dumbing down, you know, and it, it's getting worse. So I, I feel like it's, uh, yeah, it almost makes me a bit angry. When I look at TikTok, I'm like, what? The, yeah. Oh, yeah, what the F? Yeah. And uh, but even like getting back to what you said about music too, it's like when you when you study music and you study lyrics and it's not ripped apart, it's it's someone's true, you know, true person true like they they wrote it it means more even though the, the music like there's some music i listen to i'm like why are these guys not big these guys get good music then when you listen to more of the albums you're like man, there's a lot of there's it's good but there's they need to grow a little bit how are they gonna grow i don't know i'm not a musician so but i just know they need to change something up they need to learn maybe a new note they need to learn a new uh, a new um you know switch from guitar to a bass it's like even with writing like so when you say you write songs i call them songs it could be called poems whatever but when you write short stuff, you learn how the power of words, right? So then when I write fiction, I can kind of do a different way. Like I can write a little bit differently. When I do analysis pieces, I can even do it a little bit different, but all of them coexist. But if I just did one, it'd be very dry. I'd hit a wall and I'd be like, all right, like I need to, for, I don't know if you have this, but when you write those songs, like for me, I call them bursts. I like, I had a burst, like now, I don't even know how long, it was like six weeks ago. I had like three weeks where I was like barely sleeping. And I'm like literally writing stuff from 2 a.m. to like 3 a.m., fall asleep, wake up at 4, writing another one. And they kept popping. I'm popping 2, 3 a day. And it's always at, it's always like at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. Can't be at 3 in the afternoon. Can't be at noon when you're awake. It's always like when you're, you know, your mind's in like dream world. And uh, and you start, so I don't know if you ever have those. You ever have those bursts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I had one the, the other day. So I, no, I, I try to... You know, I go to bed quite late as well, but it's uh, I try not to get too much into the nighttime because then if you have like tennis at 10 or something, you're dead. Like, I mean, and I, I you know, I'd rather be hung over than without sleep. Sleep without sleep, it's it's a disaster, right? So usually they coincide, but but it's like uh, it's very bad uh, for me when I'm not sleeping. But generally, like I have a creative period, then I feel really good. Like I feel like, you know, I'm doing stuff and, you know, you're, you're three hours pass by uh, just working on something and it's it's fun. It's it's really you feel very much alive. I think even if you don't do a lot of stuff, it's just you and the guitar or the or the notebook or whatever. But it's like you feel very alive. I think compared to some other moments. Yeah, and I think what happens with artists and stuff. They when you get the burst, whatnot. When they disappear, you're like, well, I want it back, and you're like, well, you can't have it back. You you have to do whatever it is you have to do to get it back. You have to do. You have to go live life. You have to go experience stuff. But I understand where some of these people get into heroin and like drugs and. They're like, well, that's what made me think like this. I'm like, nah, probably not. But anyway, if that's what you think, I guess. But I never tapped into any of that stuff. Like I was never, the burst's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm not looking for any extra boost. I don't think really that, ha I mean, like, okay. I mean, after reading a lot of like singer songwriter biographies and stuff, uh, or, you know, and or writers and their biographies, it's like, it doesn't seem like drugs helps at all. It's more about, it numbs some of the pain. They probably feel that's why they're writing in the first place, right? So they have some scar tissue and they're trying to, you know, deal with that. So the drugs are like, you know, you can write and then you, you know, you don't take drugs to be creative. You take it to kind of escape the the emotion you want to escape. That's 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 my guess, you know. It's it's uh, not into drugs either. Uh, so it's like, but it, it feels like it's, you. the excuse is I'm going to be more creative when I do this. And it's it's not really, I don't think. Hey, you're running. I think everything is, is running, really, pretty much, you know. Uh, getting back into the book, I, I opened a page. I just wanted to ask you. Yeah. Um, so it's page 15 here where it says, add side serving your weakest position. Can you explain that? Daniel Collins. It could be that Daniel Collins. Uh, I just put, picked a page here. Uh, grow up, let the coaches coach, let the players play. Yeah. No, as like you said, just like hiding something, just running from something. Getting back into the book, I, I opened a page. I just wanted to ask you. Yeah. Um, so it's page 15 here where it says, add side serving your weakest position. Can you explain that? Daniel Collins. It could be that Daniel Collins. Uh, I just put, picked a page here. Uh, grow up, let the coaches coach, let the players play. Yeah, I think that piece I, I wrote about Daniel Collins match pre-Australian Open. Um she had some weak patterns, but you can work on those patterns when you're doing a ground stroke game. I mean, generally the rule of thumb is 
get a little technical. Like if you need to, I don't like to, I just like to think of spots. Cause the other thing too is the thing I tell the students is if you think technically, you're not gonna be able to hit the spots. If you think spots, you're going to think technically and you're going to hit the spots. So you're trying to kill two birds with one stone instead of the other way. Cause for instance, a lot of kids I have to teach in this area, I, I pick up from other programs and they're technical programs and the kids can't hit the spots. And I'm like, how, I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you, you just focus on your looks? I go, that's like, that's like, I mean, not that for lack of a better term, like that's like a blonde looking in the mirror. Like you're trying to get all these looks, but there's emptiness inside. Like uh, that's why I look at tennis the same way. When I see like really good technique, I'm like, well, there's something off there. It's like a lot of emptiness in the, inside the mind that they're, they're just gonna be focused on winter ball or crank or what they look like. But, um, but in that piece, I'd have to like dig back into it, but I forgot what I wrote about Daniel Collins. She has, she had a couple of patterns. If, if you work on it from a box training standpoint and you you can add to your to your game plan when you add the serve into it it just adds a little bit more because what a lot of players don't realize and a lot of coaches is when i'm feeding you a ball at like 15 20 miles an hour it's not the same as a serve coming at 60 80 100 it's like a totally different look the ball is coming faster so that's why these kids can't their plus ones are terrible is because they're not doing enough service patterns and uh they'll just do baseline stuff but there was something about her that she had to do. I laughed. I sent it to her agent, and yeah, I get crickets, but but I'm like, hey, this was good stuff. Like, if, if she reads it, which I'm, I'm sure she read a little bit, but um, the problem with me is if I go online, is people are going to start recognizing me, maybe, maybe not. They'll be like, I think I know that guy from somewhere. Like, I don't know what I know that guy from. I'm like, oh, that's the guy that called Daniel Collins a bitch. Um, but, like, but like, if I go to the U.S. Open, I'm like, I got to make sure I wear a hat and sunglasses. Yeah, I, I don't think you mean it in that way. I, I think it's about having uh, that in, inner fighter, right, really. But you can use the words that are more uh, effective or the words that are less effective, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, so it's a lot of interesting things in the book. So for people listening to this, I think you should check it out. You can, I guess, check it out on, on Amazon. So you, there's like this uh, sample, right, or something. Usually they have that feature if they're interested. I, I will also add some uh, some screens here in, in this this podcast on the visual part of it, you know. For me, I just break it into like player packages, a philosophy, like is it going to be a good part of it, like 50, 60 pages of a philosophy, like that three box system I did there. And like I already said, I got another three box system that should come out, but I'll probably add it to that book. I'm not trying to make another book because um, Amazon, you know, I didn't realize Amazon takes a chunk of it. I didn't think it was going to be like that. That's why. So I, I put the book at thirty nine ninety nine because I'm getting fourteen bucks. I'm not getting anything from these books. I don't know if people understand that, but no. But it's I mean, if you work with a publisher, it's 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 pretty bad as well. But yes, I am not defending Amazon like they are. Uh, well, I I published my two novels. I mean, I sold a lot of in the first one, but the cut of Amazon is is like seventy percent. Like depending on your structure, if you pick, if you go for a lower price, they will give you seventy percent. But if you go for a little bit higher price, they will take. 70 percent so um and it, then they have the kindle select which is a little bit different but it's it's yeah it's not so easy to make money you need to sell a boatload pretty much to make any money with with amazon i put it just at 7.99 like i see these other books down there for 7.99 but i'm like i would have made like two dollars a book or something <laughs> like it would have been like nothing yeah but like let's say like if you would put it at 9.99 i i i published a book about rackets now like which is the, the basics of rackets and, and my recommendations of rackets and strings and that's I put it at nine ninety nine because um, they uh, I was gonna put more like maybe twenty, but I would probably get I get almost as much at nine ninety nine as I could do it at twenty right because they 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 flip the the model, and you can understand how much money they make when considering these these models are are yeah they they feel pretty pretty rough but it's the same with like we have an app in the app store they also take thirty uh, percent of everything so so it's like you you the cuts are pretty big. People uh, need to realize that. So when they're paying, if they feel like something is expensive, app, book, whatever, um, keep in mind that it's it's not easy to price it properly because you're not getting any of the sh like the shares. They take the lion share sometimes, or at least a, a big chunk, right? Yeah, I'm trying to get back to old school. Like, so friends, I have my two little ones on Tuesday nights. They have a sleepover with me, but I was thinking about buying some Nerf guns and uh, just having some Nerf gun wars and getting going old school with. Uh, some of the evenings get them off their tablets and, and just and just start shooting but my kids are boneheads even when they're younger like and boneheads in a way that like 
I had a Nerf guns. I would buy Nerf guns. I would literally shoot them and they'd come back and hand me the bullets. I'm like, you handed me the bullets I just shot you with. I'm just going to shoot you again. I'm like, what are you doing? Why would you take them and, and, and wait me out? But, but they were kind of funny. It was kind of, it was a different time. You know, I wouldn't have given back the bullets. I would have put them in my pocket and ran. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I, I, a good point you started with earlier. I also wanted to get to was, um, if you build your early points a certain way and establish a pattern and continue that pattern on game points, you'll be, you'll be in a constant state of establishing a pattern which heightens emotion. What comes from emotional thinking? Bad decisions. And then you drew a devil, which was very cute. Um, but if you learn to divert them by throwing in a change, it will pay dividends down the road. So it's like this, you know, of, of having this system makes you a bit more of a... Of a it takes away some of the emotion because I think you see that with some players. I'm also very emotional on a tennis court, which is is a problem for me. Some, not emotionally in a way I break rackets. I'm not like that at all. But it's more like if I feel good, I play well. If I if I feel like, you know, I have confidence because I like to go for the shots. Uh, but it becomes such like a just emotional game where if you're a bit more rational and you, you think like, okay, I lost that point, but that's because of this, then you can adapt and you will probably win more points just doing that. I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's a struggle because like you're some of your nature comes out on the tennis court, I think. Is that a little bit of the point of, of this um, this pattern here or did this uh, segment? So it's it's my memory, right? So like I call it chasing winners too. Like so friends, I I grew up in the fed ball generation. Like a lot of coaches were feeding balls. So when I go play my points while well, I'm playing fed ball type points, which means I'm cranking my back and down the line. Like I love like just ending points. I love just, I can end points on ball one or ball 20. I don't really care. But at some point you give me a, you're going to give me a back and I'm going to put it away. I don't care where I am in the court. And that's how I trained 10 feet behind the baseline. I can pop them. Um, at least when I was younger, now I'm 48. So it's like, I can still do it, but it has to be the right, right shot. When I was a kid, it didn't have to be. But, um, the point being is when you have so much muscle memory built on these winners, these shots you're hitting, when you play a higher level, it doesn't work. Like you it's, you can't chase the winner. And so it becomes more emotional. So for instance, if I, all my forehands to boxes one, two, and three, and I set them up and I take only my backhand to box three. It's it's simple, right? So I can start out with that kind of a pattern and keep banging box three, box three. Once I open up box one with my forehand and you're starting to get used to it, well, after I divert from it down the road is, is I'm going to be banging my, box, my backhand to box one, two. So once I start opening up the double pattern with my backhand, but the, the thing is like, when people talk, like you said, when you when you're playing well, you, you you feel good. When you're playing bad, you you don't feel as good. I don't feel it either either way. Like I just go out and play. Whatever I have that day, I use. But I just know that if I just simplify my backhand to box three, I'm gonna have a lot of looks on forehands. And then when I get a lot of looks on forehands, I can pop either corner. But usually, if I'm playing a one two three, I'm just looking to crank box one. And you'll see over time it starts opening up. When they, they have to start covering for box one, it opens up box four down the road. And it's, but it, the fun part for me is like when you set the guy up, when you set or set the player up, her, him, doesn't matter. Um, when you just keep manipulating them, but then it comes back to who you are as a person. And like, if you knew me, you'd know <laughs> I'm a manipulator. Like, you know, I'm the youngest of five. I was always like, had to be, had to outsmart everybody. I was the smallest kid, had to be, had to be paying attention all the time. How to learn how to win. I think that's important um, in general, right? We're learning how to win. Like, and also, um, I mean, learning how to accept losses is, is important, but uh, but learning how to win as well. Finding ways when you are not playing well. Because I think if you play like um, kind of showtime tennis, you know, which I like, uh, I'm a big victim of, of that. Or <laughs> victim, I'm not maybe, but uh, I, I tend to do that. And then you're not feeling it. You don't have like a natural plan B, right? You don't, if you if you look at the points more on a rational point, you're like, okay, this system is not working because my opponent has is doing this and I'm not countering or and I'm not finding my forehand down the line, whatever you want, you're going for. Then you can at least go for plan B, C, D, E or whatever, you know. But if if you have plan A or A, a plus, it's it's not it's not so good, you know. And I I think I've seen that a lot, like maybe on the WTA tour is a bit different that people go a lot more. You'd call it winner ball, but it, it's it's it feels like it's a little bit more. Um, primal, a bit more raw tennis. It's like who can hit the hardest in the corner at the right time, you know. And and, and it's it, I think as a WTA player, you can get really far with whatever stroke you have if you work on mental strength and 
just uh, strat strategy, right? So if you have those two things, like you're mentally strong, you don't give up, and you're you you have strategy, I think you can like reach quite far on the WTA tour. You don't need that power really. Um, do you agree with that, or do you think I'm? Uh... No, I agree. For me, like, do do I think a like a like a system like I wrote like a one two three and a two three four would work on WTA? It will, but I I mean they're more open patterns. Um, you know, I don't know if it's the balls just a little bit slower. I don't know if the the balls are a little bit shorter, or you know, like I said, like you're working a different kind of stretch on them. So when I talk about mids, like a box one to three or a two to four, with the women, you just want to stretch it just a little bit more. You don't because the problem with playing winter ball in the corners is you're not working that point over. I didn't realize it so later in my career when I was almost done playing, whereas the winners were letting them off the hook. So now if I pull you off the court, like on the ad side with a kick serve or with a wide serve and I crank it to the center, I'm letting you touch it, but you're really not in a good position. Now I can work the corner after that. So now I just made you, I made you run and I'm going to beat you anyway, you know, but if I just hit a kick serve out wide and hit the box one and just hit a winner, it's like such a waste of time. I mean, those are good for when you need them. Like if I have a game point, I would want to get out of the game. They're fine, but you have to really be careful with how much winners you hit because they're going to run out after a while. Good players are going to know what you're doing. But if you can use the center of the court, I mean, that's like what the new game is right now is like really understanding why, like no one ever explained to me why the center of the court was important. So I never used it. If you're not going to explain it to me, then I'm, I don't care. I'm just going to keep cranking winners. But if you explain it to me and I start using it, and I start seeing outcomes and I start having a success. I'm like, I'm like, why did no one ever tell me this before? Why did they never explain? But if you watch old Agassi footage, Agassi was using the center of the court. Like it was crazy. Like I was like, how did I never notice this before? But that's why he was helping Djokovic was his system. You know, he worked with Djokovic for about like what? I don't know if it was six months or something, a year or less. I don't really get into the like the time frame of, but but I know he helped him with his patterns. And then all of a sudden, Djokovic, that was what maybe I don't know. You you maybe know better. I mean, 2015 maybe. It was a bit later, I think. I think even 17 or something like that. Uh, yeah, he did made changes also. I mean, obviously this is racket nerdy stuff, but they made changes to the string pattern. I think also game pattern style. Like he, I mean, I, the thing you have to give Djokovic credit for is um, that he he takes a coach, and I think this is true also for Roger in a way. Like he, they are very smart guys, and then they they bring out like the influence they think they need. So they say, hey, okay, I, I, this is what I'm struggling with. I, this coach has given me everything he can, so now I need to have a like a you know a Serve, serve coach, for example, or or like Goran, for example, for uh, for Novak, or or he finds like some other ingredient. It's almost like they're master chefs, and they're like, okay, I need a bit more salt, but I need this type of salt from Himalaya, whatever. So I'm gonna bring in this coach who's gonna help me with this. And even if it's a six month thing or a three year thing, or Boris Becker or whatever he was three years with Novak, I think, um, it seems that they they have a, such a good like gut feeling of what they need for their game. While other players might be like, okay, you know, my coach, we get along, so I'm going to stick with this guy. But they just keep on like, okay, I will add this ingredient. I will add this one because I need it. They're so good at honing in on what they need to, to be even better. Like they're already the best in the world. And then they, they want to be even better than that. You don't see that. Like that's not a common frame of mind. That's not a common stra like approach. So that, that I think is, I would say Rafa has been with his coaches for a little bit longer. He probably has the same mindset. Uh, but but with Roger and, and Novak, I think they, they've, found a way to switch coaches or add coaches at the right time to add something to their game, even if they have different styles, right? Yeah, and it comes back to like what you talked about, routines and whatnot. It's even in, if you're not even to tennis, like just all these people like work that rat race, that nine to five race, rat race work for the weekends. You got to break from it. You got you to break from it if you want to grow. If you keep doing it, you're, you're just not going to get anywhere. But it's the same thing with the tour players. Like if you have the same coach, it's the same, even for me when I'm teaching, at some point there's some kids you need to take a break from you know if there's nothing else in the area it's like it is what it is but i like i'm always like big i wasn't so much when i was younger but now i'm like i have another guy i'll like we'll switch off players we'll just they just need to hear hear it differently we're saying the same thing which is a little bit different and um you know in a way it's like fire and ice right so this this one guy's a little more positive i'm probably i'd say i'm a little bit more not negative i'm just I'm just like, look, we got to get this done and you got to do it. You're going to go do it. I joke around a lot too, but, um, but some days I'm like, look, this is a work, this is a work week. We're, we're working. We're going to, we're going to get hard. We're going to start doing sprints. We're going to like, if you fail, we're going to start running. We're going to start doing this and I'm going to pound it out of you. 
but I, I'm old school. So, but this other guy's a little more like positive. So he's, he, it's good. We work well together. It's always good to have someone who's a little off, like a little bit different. I think it's generally, yeah, like mixing it up also for like for kids, like to, to you know, you have a different voice saying one thing that might resonate with you more or less, but at least you have two different approaches to it. So you can see that then you can be like, okay, this guy says it this way, this guy says it this way, maybe it leads to the same result, or you learn how to evaluate people's intentions or people's like messages. So you'd be like, okay, you know, I like what this guy is saying. He thinks like, he seems like the guy I should listen to more. And you learn that that's a skill you learn. It's like a muscle you train, right? So I think um, just having one guy or woman or whatever uh, in your team or uh, as your kind of main inspiration throughout your career, I think it's not that great. I think you should try to mix it up a little bit. You know, even if you just add voices, not you don't need to remove or fire or or quit your relationship with someone. But it's like more about like, okay, let's let's find another voice as well to add to this, so I can figure out well, what that brings to my game, right? Whether it's a coach or whether it's a family member, or whether it's something, whatever part of life, if you're in the same people, they're, at a certain point, they're not going to challenge you anymore because they're, they're good. like, oh, that's Jonas, oh, that's Evan. You know, they just do their that the way that they do it. But when you meet new people, like it's, they challenge you in different ways. So all of a sudden, you got to grow a little bit different. Like, oh, I can't, like, for lack of a better thing, like, oh, I can't fart in front of this person because they're going to get offended. It's like, oh, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm kidding, but, um, but it's like. You, if you're too comfortable with somebody and you get away with everything, well, you're not challenging yourself. So. Yeah, get out of the comfort zone, right? If you would distill, like, why someone should read your book, like, that's a typical uh, Jimmy Fallon question, but um, what, how would you put it? Like, what, why should someone, like, look at your book and what could they gain for it from it? So they're, they're going to obviously become a better player. They're going to understand the game a little bit differently. If you're just a, a fan, you're going to start watching TV a little bit you're going to watch the tennis a little bit differently. You're going to start seeing the patterns. So in the end, I'm just unlocking people's minds to, to noticing the patterns. For me, people tell me, like, they're like, you just see the game differently than most people. And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you look at it this way? Like, why can't you see the patterns? I see them. But then when I think back to my life and how I grew up, I'm like, ah, okay. Like, maybe I spent a lot of time paying attention to patterns and movements and the way people react to everything. So with a little manipulation. But yeah, so they'll get smarter. Like this system would kill five O and below. Like when I use this system on like five O and below, when I'm teaching some of the five O's or four fives, it's, they, they get smashed by it. You know, for whatever reason, it's, it's, it works well for, for the club level. It works at the pro level too. It's just different. You know, the pros are a little bit smarter. They got a little more power. You know, you get that guy at the club who, who you can corner into a one, two, three or a two, three, four and keep manipulating. I mean, it's, it's, you can just flip flop it the whole time and it works the whole time. But, um, but you have to do the box training. You know, a lot of these, these club players just like to play sets, but you're not going to get better that way. If you sit there and you, you work on a little bit of the box training, you do a couple of combination drills. Um, like some of the stuff I post, whether it's a, a manipulation of the, the boxes and then you make that into muscle memory. It's, it I mean, it's, it's like taking candy from a baby at the club level. Yeah, no, I, I and I agree. I think it's it's um I, I like that you point out that it makes you look at tennis differently because I think a lot of people look at tennis and when when you've been in tennis for so long uh, as you have and I I have partly as well like I've you know been watching tennis for ages and and trying to study tennis as a sport but there is always layers to it you know and and this is really like can be eye opening in a way that how you can construct points and how people construct points outside the norm because i think people think that it's just mindlessly going hitting somewhere where there's either no one or the, the player is not there or uh, or just a, like a safe ball but there's a lot more in between that it's not like the safe ball and or the open court there's a lot of, of layers to unpack in between and i think this is what kind of the aim of the book is a little bit how i would look at it you know it's like you know you are you aren't starting to understand the sport in a bit of a broader sense yeah, and it's like when we when we pattern it back to music, it's like when I say like, well, why is this band not popular? Well, they make some great songs, but just not enough. Where a great band will maybe make a little bit more great songs. It's the same thing with tennis players. Like, there's some players like like I'll use Fritz as an example. Like, not to pick on him, he's a great player. Like, hey, I'm not whatever. He kicked my butt. Um, but when he plays, I don't sit there. I'm not wowed by his like his his thinking process. I just he just sits there and cranks. He sets up for cranks. He's in shape. That works. But 
has he won a major yet? You know, so it's like, does he want to win a major? Maybe he doesn't want to win a major anyway. But what do you think of a player like Tiafo, for example? Is he better at uh, thinking while playing? He's a, he's a showman. Yeah, they're very similar. You know, he's more of a showy guy. Like Fritz is more of a. I mean, it shows a personality, right? Like, if you look, like, who would you hang out with? Would you hang out with Fritz or would you hang out with Tiafo? I'd hang out with Tiafo. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. It's like I mean, he, he's. I heard also from uh, even from Rick, who worked with him, Rick Macy, and uh, he seems like a great guy. You know, um, I mean, nothing against Fritz. Obviously, he seems chill, but but it's also like the energy you get, and I think also tennis needs that. But it, it kind of goes back to the question: like, let's say you are a guy like Tiafo, you always have a smile on your face, you try to have that positive energy. Will you? I mean, you have to play who you are a bit. Is in my opinion. Opinion. I don't know if it's like 100 percent by my opinion, but it's like that. I, that's my feeling, right? Like you, you use your energy on the tennis court as well. So you see someone like Medvedev, a super intelligent guy, um, unorthodox strokes, but you know technically sound. But he he always puts the ball in. He's he's ready for an altercation, right? This is not like he's he's ready for it. So he's gonna play with you, and, and uh, he's gonna say tell the audience what he thinks. And he's just there for it. That's just his personality. So it, it just works well with who he is, the way he plays, right? And and Tiafo, I, I, it's hard for me to see a guy like Tiafo not play that unnecessary drop shot or the ball between the legs. It's just who he is. So he's he's gonna bring that to the table. Uh, but do you think like there's stuff to be done to you know can he improve a lot by learning some of that or having some restraint or for example? Well, you look at his back, real punchy, right? So. He can only do so much with that punch back, and so he's got to mix up the slice. And I mean, I'm very similar. Like I have a, I don't have a heavy topspin backhand. I have a ripper, and I can just crank, crank, crank all day. But I'm from the old school. But my slice is my changeup. So if he understands how to use a slice effectively, which it seems he does, uh, I mean that's why he's a top twenty guy. Uh, but also when you can serve 135, 140, and, and paint the corners, I mean that's what do. he's got good hands. I mean. Out of the Americans, I mean, I think I told you this already. I like him. I like watching him. He's like a Kyrgios version, right? So when when we don't get to see Kyrgios play, we, we're losing something. That's what I don't understand with the purists. The purists don't like Kyrgios, but I love I love that guy. I like when he throws the underhand serves, and I like when he hits between the leg shots. I even do that in lessons, my, my, my stuff now, and I laugh. I'm like, I hit between the leg winners. I'm like, should run down a kind of a crappy drop shot, and the kid's coming into the net, and I just pop an in-betweener right down the line for a winner. I just laugh about it. I'm like... Because you don't know what's happening. If I set up on a forehand, you know what's going to happen. I'm either going to go cross court line. When I set up, and you, you're like, "What's he doing?" And all of a sudden, I pop up between a leg shot down the line. You're like, eh. "Like I wasn't expecting that." I'm like, "Well, oh, oh well." Like, is it possible to change who you are on the tennis court? Like, it's 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 like it's so ingrained after millions of shots. I mean, obviously, you can learn more about like different patterns. And I'm I'm saying this from the pro side. I think you can always on like a four point five, you can definitely improve a lot, and you can also change the way you play to win more matches. For example, like I had a tournament on this senior store I'm playing where I was just, okay, I'm just going to play like super consistent down the line, use the middle all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I won all my matches except for one where I was completely outmatched by the guy who was like, you know, pro level kind of. So um, that that was just like, it worked, you know. But then I go back to playing like brain dead uh, tennis uh, like the other day I played. So I was like, oh my God, what is this, you know. Just going for it too much, so it's like it it goes back and forth, but but it definitely yeah. You can look at it like this, like I like a lot of times I use like what I call a divorce theory, but even before I was divorced, I would say, you know, it's it's not the divorce, it's what led to the divorce. It's like so, for instance, when when these players get they they play so long, and their muscle memory is so ingrained, it takes like a kind of a divorce to get them out of their own head. But if they don't get that, they're, they're just going to keep doing the same thing. Or like what you said, I love doing that too. Like I love just come out here and play what I call meathead ball. I just come out and crank. I just come out with the players maybe only like a 6, 7 UTR. I just come out and just, I'm just blasting balls and they just laugh. And I'm just like, hey, you know, I'll hit with you extra time. But today's just one of those days I'm out here to just bang and, uh, and uh, not think, shut everything down, pop corners. But, uh, but that's when we're playing. Usually, I don't do that too too often. But it, it has to come out every now and then. For why does it have to come out? I have no idea. Sometimes it's just periodically. Every three four months, I just have one of those days where I'm just 
I'm just in a crank mood. I just want to start cranking winners. Yeah, no, I think it's also tennis is a mood game, right? So it's so connected to you're alone out there. If you're feeling not great, you will play not great. If you're feeling like, wow, you know, today I'm so relaxed, I'm enjoying my life, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you suddenly can't miss, right? So it's it's just part of, of being a human, right? And that's what reflects on the court. That's in my opinion, at least. Um, I have to quit because I have to go to the tennis court and hit some tennis balls. Uh, so I want to tell everyone, like, go and to Amazon and check out Shell Game. That's your new book. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments and give your review on Amazon. I'm going to hit some, I'm going to go to the range, hit some golf balls before I go to teach. And then I'm going to go teach and I'm going to try to get nine holes in there. <laughs> Mr. Golfer. I like it. I like it. Yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll get into it at some point as well. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping, like I said, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep in touch with stuff. If you, you, you're never coming to the States as much, right? Anymore. I might do later this year. We'll see if I go to the Open or something. I, I don't know. I, I would love to come. I mean, I've been invited to a uh, to tennis warehouse and and to uh, some things. We'll we'll see if I can uh, scramble it together. Yeah, if, if you come to the Open, that's easy. Um, if I ever go over there, I'll let you know. Because like I said, next year that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to be in Spain for at least two weeks. In Spain is a good place. All right, man. Have a nice day. Nice talking, nice talking to you. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later.